Hey, welcome to the Iceberg Lounge. I'm your host, Thomas Single, and today on the show, I will be talking about the beginnings of pro wrestling in the United States, which ranges from the 1860s to the 1940s. This is part two, which will be covering from the early 1900s to 1950. First, let's talk about the rise of pro wrestling. So, at the time, the wrestling capital of the U.S., in the early 1900s was the Midwest where European communities would continue on fighting styles they had back in Europe. Even with the impresarios, carnies, and barnstormers slowly starting the early sports entertainment movement, the majority of wrestlers and wrestling was still competitive. The popularity made pro wrestling at the time the second biggest sport in the U.S., with baseball being number one. And this popularity popularity was from 1900 to 1915. With the popularity came trading cards and competitive wrestling programs and athletic clubs and schools, both college and, and high school, which are still here today. This would lead, though, sadly, to the fall of pro wrestling, starting in 1915 and going through 1920. The American public started to doubt the legitimacy and sports status of pro wrestling. It didn't help that even wrestlers at the time saw it as largely fake by er by as early as the 1880s probably thanks to the impresarios, the carnies, and barnstormers. Another reason for this down popularity was the retirement of Frank Gotch in 1913, and with no replacement with star power, the fans' attention was lost. So with the fall of pro wrestling, let's start talking about the expansion era, which ranged from 1920 to 1940. At the time, it seemed the Midwest was the only place pro wrestling could thrive because of the legitimate wrestlers taking on all comers at state fairs. Besides that, everywhere else was losing interest fast. It seemed that without Gotch, no one could reach the fans. And so the media at the time focused on its illegitimacy and not on the athleticism of pro wrestling. But before we see who would repopulize pro wrestling, let's hear from our sponsor. We are back. Now, three wrestlers would try to change the outlook of pro wrestling by joining together to create their own promotion in the 1920s. These wrestlers were Ed Lewis, Bill Sandow, and Toots Mott, otherwise known as the Gold Dust Trio. They were referred to by this name because of their financial success with the promotion. What made this promotion different from the rest was that they were the first to use time limits, flashy new moves, and have actual signature maneuvers. The trio would also popularize tag team wrestling, being the first to introduce ref distractions during the matches. The trio's key to their legacy is found in them being the first to use a regular group of wrestlers in a show. This is known in modern day as a roster. Doing this helped with long-term angles and helped feuds come to be. This also kept other promotions from having their talent and brought a fresh and unique look to pro wrestling. This was the most successful time from the trio, um, with the time being about five years from 1920 to 1925. During this time, they would perform in Eastern Territory and get major exposure in big cities. With all this success, though, drama would incur versus two other pro wrestlers at the time. But this started when a trio recruited a rookie named Wayne Munn, who they were going to push as champion. 
and make him their new star and main attraction. Munn ended up winning the championship in only a few months. Munn then had a championship defense against a man, let me let me try to pronounce this, Stanius Laris Zabisco. The trio had Munn winning, but Zabisco had different plans and ended up winning the championship despite their original booking. After the win, Zabisco dropped the championship to Joe Stetcher, who was a rival of the trio's Ed Lewis, making this whole situation a nightmare not only for Lewis, but the whole trio. Stetcher was a booker, and this made it hard for the trio to regain the championship because Stetcher was afraid to lose and refused to wrestle many people. This caused the trio to call the original Munn v. Zabisco match illegitimate, and they recrowned Munn as champion. But then, Munn lost the championship to Ed Lewis. This caused there to be two champions, Lewis and Stetcher, both rivals to each other. Both would agree, though, to have a World Championship Unification match years later in 1928. Lewis was able to beat Stetcher and become Unified World Champion. After the Zabisco Stetcher incident, the Goldust Trio was never the same. Here were the damages caused as such Detraction. Uh, of the trio's dominance over pro wrestling, devaluation of the world championship because of the Munn v. Zabisco match, and Munn losing credibility as a major star permanently. The goal does trio's empire seem to have fallen. After the fall of the Gold Dust Trio's empire, just like in the late 1800s, small wrestling companies were at war against each other again in the 1930s and 1940s after a vacuum was formed after the fall. In 1948, a confederation was formed between independent wrestling companies. This was called the National Wrestling Alliance, or the NWA. In the late 1940s, to 1950, the NWA chose Luthez as the man they wanted to be the single unified world heavyweight champion of the NWA. This would be a tough job for the new face of the NWA. And we will continue on talking about the history of pro wrestling in the next big era known as the television era. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Iceberg Lounge. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, and share this podcast. Thanks to our sponsor, Anchor, and our Patreon VIPs who show support. If you want to become a VIP, go to patreon.com slash trji, and for only $1 a month, you can become a VIP of the Iceberg Lounge. If you want more info about sources uh, in this episode or my social media, It will all be in the information section of this episode. Thanks again, and remember, I love you and all to God.